We certainly want to welcome everyone to uh, Gordon Avenue Baptist Church. We especially welcome those of our congregation that's able to assemble with us this evening. And we're certainly glad uh, for those who may be tuning in by way of our Facebook live feed. We welcome you to our service as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then uh, Brother Steve is going to come and uh, lead us in uh, a worship song. And uh, then we'll get right into our Bible study. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that you give us again to uh, assemble ourselves together and to worship and to study your precious word. God, we pray that you would be very present in uh, what we do here. And uh, Lord, that you would open our hearts and minds to receive a message from you. And that you would teach us more about your word, that we might instill it into our souls and share it in a lost and a dying world. And this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Brother Steve. Hang it in. Well, take your hymn on, turn to page 608. the Lord. I, I like that little song, We'll Work Till Jesus Comes. That's one of the greatest things that you and I can do uh, for the glory of God is to continue to work and to do and to try to point men, women, boys, and girls to our Lord and our Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. Well, I want us to continue our little Bible study that we began last week. Uh, titled A Biblical View of End Times. A Biblical View of End Times. And I'll bring you the second in a series of messages titled Satan's Superman. And uh, this was kind of a lengthy message, so we had to kind of break it in two. And so I'll bring you part one of that study of this evening. Let me remind you that uh, we've already taken prayer requests and we do have a prayer list and we'll look at those uh, things right after our Bible study. And uh, so those of you who may be tuning in by our uh, Facebook Live, uh, we invite you to just type in the comments uh, section. Uh, if you have a prayer request, uh, please type those in so that we can pray for your request as well. All right, in your Bibles, Daniel chapter number 8. Daniel chapter number 8. 
I want us to look at one verse of Scripture as our text verse uh, this evening. Verse 23. Notice what the Bible says here. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding, dark sentences, shall stand up. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word, and now we thank you for the opportunity to try to teach or preach this evening. We ask that you would take the vessel of clay that we yield to you, and that you would speak through it words of wisdom that would help us understand where we're living. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will remember, last week we looked at the rapture of the church. And we talked about the rapture of the church. Now, this evening I would like to begin uh, this particular message that deals with Satan's Superman. Uh, this particular message will focus on the life and the work of the person who will be known as the Antichrist. Now, some 40 billion people have lived on the earth since Adam, if not more, since Adam was created in the Garden of Eden. And since that time, our world has witnessed the advent of many talented, many intelligent, and many powerful people. However, my friend, none of these who have ever lived is able or will be able to have matched this man who will be born and known as the Antichrist. He will be the most powerful individual that's ever lived. He will be deceitful. He will be intelligent beyond intelligence. He will be brutal. He will be ruthless. And he will be efficient. He will represent the pinnacle of all that man can achieve apart from God. He will literally be the devil's superman. Now, I want us for just a few moments to look at uh, some things and see what the Bible has to say about this Superman. In verse 23, we see the appearance of, of Satan's Superman. Our text tells us that in the end times, a fierce king will stand up. But what are the signs of his appearing? Can men know when this Superman will appear? Well, the answer to that question is both yes and no. Now, preacher, how can the answer be yes and no? Well, I am certain that no man knows exactly who the Antichrist is or exactly when he will appear. But the Bible does tell us that there are certain things uh, that uh, accompany his appearance. And uh, so let's talk about these things. Is these signs uh, uh, that we're going to look at fulfilling right before our face uh, in the day and in the hour that we live in? Well, I want to give you several things. First of all, I want to talk about the condition of the world. You see, when this Superman makes his entrance into the world, my friend, the world will be in terrible, a moral condition. Now, I don't know how you may feel about this, but if you look at our world today, I believe that we are living in terrible moral conditions. What about that? I believe that you'll agree with me that we're living in terrible moral condition. Now the Bible teaches us that this is evidenced 
by two passages of Scripture that gives us reference to the end time. And uh, I'm not going to ask you to turn your Bible there. You can if you want to. But I want to give you these Scripture references so that you'll have them. And I want to tell you what the Bible says in these Scripture references. Over in the book of Luke's Gospel, chapter number 17, if you look at verse 26 and you look at verse 27, the Bible says here, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. Now, if you're looking at the King James Version, it says Noe, you know, we, Noe. Uh, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of, of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, and they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the floods came and destroyed them all. Friends, I don't know where you are or what you believe, but I think that we're living in days just like uh, the days that Noah was commanded by God to build an ark. I believe that. I believe that things have gotten that bad, things have gotten that bad in the world today. So that's a sign of Satan's coming as Superman. And then over in 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, listen to what the Bible says here. The Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own self. Boy, we're living there right now, aren't we? Amen. Men shall be lovers of their own self. Covetous. Boasters. Proud. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful. Unholy. Without natural affection. Boy, we could preach right there for a little while. Amen. Taking the natural use of God's creation and trying to make it something that it's not without natural affection. Truce breakers. False accusers. Uh, fierce despisers of those that are good. Boy, we see that right now. Amen. Traitors, heavy, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having, listen, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And Paul tells the young preacher from such, turn away. Friends, we are seeing the signs of the birth of Satan's Superman fulfilled right in front of our faces. All of these things that Paul mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 is happening as I speak. It's easy to see that our world already bears the marks that suggest a fulfillment of, of the coming of Satan's Superman. Now it is my conviction that the world itself is ready for this Superman to appear. All the signs point to his appearing. So we see the condition of the world. But then there's a second thing that I want us to see. I want us to see the corruption of religion. The corruption of religion. Over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, listen to what the Bible says here. 
The Bible says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall come, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Friends, we're seeing the greatest falling away of the church in all of history. The doors to many churches are closing today. And people are pointing their fingers and they're blaming it on disease. But friend, the church was diseased before the disease hit. There is a great falling away of the people. I can remember a time when I was just a young boy at Waterloo Baptist Church. We had windows that we could raise in the church back in those days. Now we had air conditioning, but it, it was a little bit different than it is now. It seems like we had several window units in the old church. But I can remember old brother Roy Burdett standing up to preach the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ of and there wasn't enough room to get the people into the church. And so the church men would raise the windows and families would hang in the windows to hear the word of God. I remember that well. I was always glad we got there early because we got a place to sit. But that's how hungry people were for the Word of God in that day. There's a few people that's still hungry for the Word of God. But there's more falling away today than ever before. The Antichrist will appear during a time of religious apostasy. The falling away of the church. And friends, it could be today. This refers to a time when organized and visible religion will depart from the doctrine of the Word of God. There are people that will tell you that the Bible is not the Word of God. My friends, since the New Testament was written for and about all believers, uh, uh, we've got to conclude that this falling away will be apparent in the churches and that denominations will operate under the umbrella of Christianity that there'll be a falling away there too. We're already experiencing it. Among the Methodist movement, there is division. Don't look spiritual, Baptist, because I got news for you. Among the Baptist movement, there is division. And that is symbolic of the great falling away that's taking place right in front of our faces. I hope that everyone understands that just because your uh, name is written on a church roll or, or, or you're a part of a denomination that calls itself a Christian work, that it doesn't really make it true or so. You must be born again. Amen. Amen. You must have a personal relationship with Jesus. Friend, I could take your name and write it on the church roll of this church until you die and go to hell. And you wouldn't make it. But when you have a personal relationship with Jesus, and he writes your name in the Lamb's book of life, well, glory, I tell you what, that's when it gets to be real. Days in which we lived are marked by a rapid departure from the foundational truth of Christianity. There was a time when a man, if he told you that he was a Christian, that you could pretty much take it to the bank. He believed the Bible. He believed Jesus died. He believed in the shed blood of Calvary's cross. There might have been a few doctrinal differences, but my friend, for the most part, that person believed in the virgin birth of Christ, 
the substitutionary death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ and believed that Jesus will soon return. The Bible is the Word of God. In other words, a Christian person was one who had a personal relationship that we've already talked about with Jesus and accepted all that the Bible teaches and says concerning Him. A person may deny the virgin birth this day and time and still claim to be a Christian. I have a problem with that. A person can call themselves a Christian and cast doubt on the accuracy of the Bible. I have a problem with that. A person may doubt that Jesus really died on the cross of Calvary and that he rose from the dead and still claim that they're a Christian. I have problems with that. Something's wrong with this picture, if you believe that. Cults are growing by leaps and bounds with genuine Christianity consistently finding itself under the gun from society, under the gun from the government, under the gun from organized religion. There are some things that are nailed down so firmly in the Word of God that there should never be any question about them whatsoever. Jesus was virgin born. Jesus did die on the cross. Jesus did shed his blood. Jesus did take my place on the cross. It should have been mine. Jesus did raise from the dead. And Jesus will come again just like he said he would. Amen. Bless God, I knew I'd preach tonight instead of trying to teach. But it's the truth. We're seeing major attacks on biblical doctrine. When we see churches and denominations turning away from the truth of the living God at an alarming speed, my friend, we're seeing apostasy and the walking away from true doctrine. And God's not pleased with that. Amen. That's the case. What hinders God's coming? We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But if that's the case, what hinders Satan Superman from coming? Think about that. He could appoint, he could, he could make an appointment to appear at any given moment. There's one event that must take place before the Antichrist can be revealed, before the tribulation period can commence. And I want to talk to you about that. What is keeping Satan Superman from appearing? The third thing, the completion of the church. Over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6 and verse 7, the Bible says here, And now ye know, what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time? For the mystery of the iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he taketh out of the way. What is this verse saying? This verse teaches us the truth that the church must be removed before the Antichrist can be revealed. Verse Six tells us that there's something that withholdeth. Verse seven says that there's one who letteth. Two words are translated from the same Greek word that means to hinder. What's hindering Satan, Superman from coming? The Bible tells us in verse seven that the spirit of the Antichrist is already at work and that's why we can see all of the evidences of his coming all around us, but there's two forces that's hindering him from making his presence known right now. Two forces. What are these two things that's hindering Satan and Superman from appearing? Number one, the true church of the living God that's hindering Satan and Superman from appearing. Number two, the Holy Spirit of God. God's Spirit is still here. You know how I know that? 
Because, bless God, I'm still here. Somebody looked at me one day and says, Brother Dan, you reckon you'd be able to preach for me Sunday if the rapture takes place? I was just a little old young preacher boy and he itching to preach. And I said, oh, I'd be glad to. And they started laughing. So let me rephrase that and slow down where you can understand what I'm saying. Will you preach for me Sunday morning if the rapture takes place? I said, oh, no. Uh -uh. No, I won't be able to preach for you because I'll be going with you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit is still here. And he's still at work. The work of the Spirit of God is convicting and judging the hearts of man. And it is a tremendous retaining force in the world. Listen to what Jesus said. In John 16, verses 8 through 11, Jesus said, and when he is come, now I want to tell you this right now, the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a he. Did you catch that? And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my Father and you shall see me no more of judgment because the princes of this world is judged. The Holy Spirit of God is keeping the devil's Superman from coming. The Spirit is at work. The Spirit is, is uh, filling the church to, to, to stand against the tide of evil and also hindering the work of the Antichrist. There is a true church of the living God. Amen. I've been a Baptist all my life. I ran from my calling whenever God called me to preach. God called me to preach in a little old Baptist church a long time ago. And I ran away from that little Baptist church because I wanted God to lead me alone. And I ran over to a little free will Baptist church. And the same God that called me in the little Baptist church called me in the free will Baptist church. So I ran away from God again and I ran to the Methodist church. I had a little Methodist preacher that was a friend and I knew him. And I ran to the Methodist church and he looked at me and he said, you're just going to have to quit running and surrender. The same God that called me in the little free Baptist and free will Baptist church called me in the Methodist church. So I left there and I ran to the church of God. Now boy, I had fun over there. I learned them church of God folks love to sing. Amen? Amen. And I had fun over there. And I got to be good friends with some good old church of God preachers and, and uh, the same God that called me in the little Baptist church, the little free will Baptist church, the little Methodist church, and, and, and he called me in the church of God too. So I looked at my old preacher buddies that I'd made friends with in that church and I said, I'm going home. They said, why are you going home? I said, don't you like it here? I said, I love it here. I said, but God's sending me home. I didn't know what God was doing at that time couldn't understand it. But I figured if God could call me in the Baptist church, the free will Baptist church, the Methodist church, the church of God, that the best thing for me to, to do was to go home to my little Baptist church. And so I did. Little did I know that about 25 or 30 years later, God was going to call me into chaplaincy. And I, that I would be ministering to all faiths. So I learned a little bit about all those faiths during that time. You look back and you see what God's doing when he begins to do it in your life. I walked up on the porch of a little Methodist woman one time and knocked on her door and I said, I'm the chaplain with Hospice of Tift Area. And I said, I've uh, come out to visit with you, to talk with you about all that's going on in your life. 
And she stood back and she said, I don't understand why I've got to have a chaplain. I've got a pastor. I've got a church home. I don't need a chaplain. And I said, well, ma'am, you don't have to have a chaplain. I said, they just send me out to see if you need one. And uh, so we talked a few minutes more and I was about to get ready to leave. And uh, I, I'd already learned that she was a little Methodist woman. She said, well, let me ask you something. She says, what kind of chaplain are you? I said, ma'am, today I'm a Methodist chaplain. She said, come on in. Come on in. And I walked in and we had one of the greatest visits together that anybody could ever have. And after it was all over, she looked at me and says, you're not really a Methodist chaplain, are you? I said, no, ma'am, I'm not. I said, but I was today. Was today. Listen, God's got a church, and it is the living church. And the church is alive. The Spirit is at work. One day, one day, I don't know when, but one day, all of this is going to change. The church is going to be raptured out of here. And then Satan's Superman will appear. In Jeremiah 37, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. In Daniel 9, 27, it's called that tribulation that was for Israel. The tribulation period is also known as a time of God's wrath in Revelation. The Bible clearly teaches us, listen, that God's children have been saved from wrath in Romans 5, 9. The greatest proof that the church will not see tribulation is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself when he was talking to the church at Philadelphia. Listen to the words of Jesus. Revelation 3.10 Because that thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now there are some who will say that the church will go through the first three and a half years of tribulation. I beg to differ with this view. I don't believe this view. If you believe that the Bible is true and you interpret the Bible literally, you have to believe that the church is going to leave this world before the tribulation period. In fact, after Revelation 3, you don't see the church no more. Because it's gone. When the church and the spirit of the living God departs, that's when Satan's Superman will begin to wreak havoc on this world. Now we're going to stop right there and we'll hook it up again uh, in a couple of weeks, okay? I'm going to pray, and Nancy, if you'll just come to the piano and just play softly, just as I am, or amazing grace. I want to give everybody the opportunity to make a commitment or a decision for Christ. If, uh, if you need to come, you step out and you come to an altar of prayer. Hands bowed, eyes closed. You don't even have to stand. You need to get up out of your pew. You come on.